Thank you so much for uh, that kind introduction. Thank you so much for inviting me to say a few words this morning. It's a, a huge honor. And I was following, actually, yesterday morning's session via the live stream and was really encouraged that when Anna asked the audience if they still felt that there was a real divide between environmentalists and farmers, at least as far as I could see from the live feed, it looked as if the answer was no. And I want to be clear that I'm speaking here today with a very deep appreciation of the wisdom and knowledge of the farming community about nature, about wildlife, about the land, and with a recognition that farmers are inherently custodians of the countryside. I want to pay particular tribute to the Cool Farm Alliance, of which MS, who are kindly sponsoring this session, was a founding member. This is a pioneering collaboration of industry, NGOs, and academics, making the best science accessible to farmers to reduce climate emissions, to reduce water use, and on-farm waste. But in spite of a myriad of individual good examples of good practice, the case that I would make today is that our agri-industrial food system is in crisis. Too often it favors consolidation in order to improve competitiveness at the expense of human health, ecology, and farmer livelihoods. I'd argue that instead we need an alternative model based on agroecological principles, a sustainable, resilient, nature-friendly food system which restores rather than undermines biodiversity and which makes a significant contribution to a zero carbon world. A food system which supports fair trade and good livelihoods for farmers and farm workers, which upholds high animal welfare standards and which enables everyone to access healthy <clears throat> and affordable food. Now, I appreciate that's very easy to say and it's an awful lot more complex to achieve and I've only got around 10 minutes to try to say how it might be started. So to narrow it down, just a bit, I'll focus on making the case for a much more joined up food and farming system and consider just three areas. First, the role of food in the agriculture debate, reinstating the F in DEFRA, which all too often goes missing. Second, re-envisaging farmers as the custodians of nature and agriculture as a restorer, not a destroyer of the countryside. And third, the creation of a fairer and more rewarding food supply chain, and one in particular that attracts more young people into farming. Just a few words before that by way of context. And as we've been hearing all morning and all of yesterday too, farming in Britain is clearly being propelled into a new era. And even assuming that we avoid the absolute disaster of a no-deal Brexit, and I, like you, was struck really by the horrors that Michael Gove set out yesterday, which a no deal would in, involve. But even if we avoid that, if Brexit goes ahead, and I still say there's an if, then we do face ahead the full force of treasury spending rounds from 2022 and the consequences of whatever trade deals might actually ensue once Liam Fox's flights of fancy come up into contact with the real harsh reality. Now, his sites, as we know, are on the major agricultural producers like the US and Australia, countries that are looking for a sizable slice of our markets and to extend the reach of their own deregulatory agenda based on standards very different from our own, whether that's for beef hormones, for GMOs, or the essentials of animal welfare. But I would argue that this is not the time to walk away from hard-won standards for healthy food and sustainable environments. Indeed, those standards are needed more urgently than ever. And as Minette Batter said so clearly yesterday, they do need to be enshrined in legislation. They do need to be written down. And they need guarantees that they won't be undercut by cheap imports that don't meet the same standards. And the reason that's, that's so important, let me just give one example. In my lifetime, just in my lifetime, we have wiped out half of our wildlife. Now, chemical agriculture isn't solely responsible, but we do need to face up to the fact that it has played a big role. Populations of bees and butterflies and other pollinators are seeing massive declines, while the consequences, say, for that remarkable bird, the swift, is that it's seen a halving of its populations in the last 20 years alone. According to the 2018 Food Sustainability Index, the UK ranks a mere 16th out of 28 EU countries, 
with a particularly poor record on climate emissions and young people in farming. So now is the moment to pick up that challenge. Whatever happens over Brexit, we have to confront what kind of farming and food system we want and how we want to get there. Now, the Agriculture Bill should have been the mechanism to bring about far-reaching change, but it lacks both a long-term vision and long-term funding commitments. It grants ministers many powers, but far too few duties. It leads on land management, but it divorces that from the wider nexus of food, farming and health. And I believe that is a serious policy failure in the making. Now, there is no single recipe for the diverse and dynamic communities that make up our country. And actually, just one point of correction on the title, I, I had said a radical alternative for, uh, for farming in this country, not the radical alternative, because I recognize there are more than one. Diversity is at the heart of what makes our farming, our countryside so unique, so special, so beautiful. But I do believe that the food system as a whole does need to focus on producing more healthy local food with fewer or no pesticides, more attention to animal welfare, greater transparency about origins and methods of production, a smaller proportion of meat and dairy in our diets from more sustainable sources, and overall far less food loss and waste. We need a more joined up approach to primary food production. Farmers should be producing the means for sustainable diets from sustainable food systems. Our goal should be to make the UK food system more resilient. And while self-sufficiency isn't the main objective, there is certainly much more scope for what could and should be grown here. And as you know, we currently grow only around 50% of vegetables, only around 60% of our fruit. A process of relocalization could see more horticulture grown here, more top fruit and soft fruit. The starting point has to be that the point of land use is not just to protect and enhance ecosystems, but to produce food and enhance ecosystems. Yet far from embracing that approach, it's often seemed that the ever-inventive Mr. Gove has taken the editorial pencil to DEFRA, deleting the F. Now, I welcome the fact that in his speech yesterday, there was more focus on food. And I welcome the fact that back in June, he asked Henry Dimbleby to craft a food strategy but let us be clear that time is running out. That food strategy should be a foundation stone for farm and land policy, not a bolt-on extra. It should be at the heart of the agriculture bill, not an afterthought. I want a thriving UK farming system which serves both food and the environment, consumers and health at the same time. Now, I recognise that Rebuilding environmental resilience isn't easy. It'll take more than motivated consumers to bring about sustainability. Farm production needs to be aligned within planetary boundaries, and perhaps nowhere more so than when it comes to its climate emissions. According to the Committee on Climate Change, there's been no progress in reducing agricultural emissions over the last 10 years at all. So they still remain at around 10% of the total. So going forward, we need to prioritize targets to bring down emissions year on year, to lead us to net zero farming in the UK as soon as possible. And I was encouraged to hear Minette Batters say that yesterday. And I very much hope that the NFU will support my amendment to the agriculture bill that would seek to achieve that. We need measures to increase the level of soil organic matter so that soil can play a much greater role in carbon sequestration and regeneration. We need more humane and human-scale methods of livestock farming, together with support for farmers to transition to less but higher quality livestock production. Now, I accept, of course, that better manure management and careful selection of feed can both help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Reducing unsustainable meat consumption needs a combination of tools, including education, changes to school and workplace menus, procurement policies, subsidies for plant-based food, but at the risk of incurring the wrath of the energy secretary in particular, who said recently that encouraging people to eat less meat would be, and I quote, the worst sort of nanny state ever, I'd add that we do need to have a serious consideration of measures like a meat tax, particularly for meat. You could have it on a banded level so that it takes account of the fact of the less intensive forms of livestock farming. And that could all be offset for more sustainable meat producers through increased revenue from targeted agri-environmental schemes. 
We need to recognise that diets are already shifting. One in eight people in the UK are vegetarian or vegan, whilst a further 20% are so-called flexitarian. And as if to prove the point just this week, we've seen the launch of Greg's new vegan sausage roll. And while it appears to have caused Piers Morgan some degree of ideological indigestion, it appears that for the rest of us, it's been broadly welcomed. And crucially, we need to bring the whole food chain into the circle of responsibility, not leaving farmers to work on their own, together with clear signals that society will play its part in funding the transition to that new kind of agriculture policy. Now, the Agriculture Bill ought to be legislating duties on ministers to support and guide that kind of transition and commit sufficient financial support from the Treasury to achieve it. But as you know, Mr Gove promises only a temporary extension of the current agricultural budget. What he does guarantee is a tapering out of direct payments. I'd argue that with well-directed and long-term support, including, for example, from water companies and other beneficiaries of fewer chemicals in the landscape, for example, farmers could plan for a sustainable transition to more extensive systems, mirroring the pathway to renewables in the energy sector. And to the extent that higher prices might be necessary for some foods, then I believe that welfare and minimum wage payments will also need to increase. Because keeping food artificially cheap cannot be allowed to be an excuse for continued environmental destruction and poor diets. So we need clearer objectives also in the Agriculture Bill linked to future targets designed to make progress in areas where even well-managed and funded environment land management plans won't be sufficient. Take the continued use of pesticide and nitrogen, both major pollutants on an unsustainable scale. A study just published found that pesticide residues were present in 82% of agricultural soils producing the main crops in Europe. We need targets for a substantive decrease in reliance on those inputs together with measures like a tax on synthetic fertilisers and a willingness, if necessary, to protect our own higher standards by imposing tariffs on cheaper imports that don't meet them. We need, I think, to have far more investment in research and trials and farmer engagement and innovative thinking. There's been too slow progress, for example, in developing integrated pest management examples. And we can learn much from other countries like France where they are grappling with this and moving forward much more quickly. And my final point, because I'm sure you're about to uh, let me know that my time is up. I simply want to say that an elephant in the policy room is how little money gets back to primary growers. And as many of you in this room know only too well, most money is made off the land or beyond the farm gate. According to DEFRA's October 2018 agriculture report, UK farming accounted for 8.4 billion in gross value added in 2017. Minus the subsidy, it shrinks to 5.1 billion, far less than other sectors within the overall food chain, well below 10% of total food sector GVA. And that, by any notion, simply isn't fair. So I think we need to see proposals from the government on fairness and social inclusion, not just for farmers, but for disadvantaged rural communities. And those challenges must be spelt out before finalizing the policy levers or still less setting the budget. And let's think outside the box. So yes, extend and strengthen the Groceries Code Adjudicator protect, to protect farmers from unfair trading practices, reinstate the Agriculture Wages Board in England, but we could go further than that. We could consider, for example, restricting the 100% relief from inheritance tax, currently available to all landlords, regardless of the length of time for which they're prepared to let land, and applying it instead only to those prepared to let for, say, 10 years or more. That could be one way to offer more opportunities for tenant farmers. A tenant right to buy policy could be investigated, learning perhaps from the experience of the crofter's right to buy in Scotland, and with restrictions on future sales to prevent unreasonable private gain. There is plenty of scope for more innovative thinking. But why, by way of, of conclusion, I appreciate that these are hugely uncertain times. And without policy certainty, it is immensely difficult for the farming community to plan for the future. I've made it the case that I think the only future that I see is to realign food and farming with ecosystem and human health. There's no reason why a food and farming transition to sustainability with accountability and affordability cannot be led from the UK. I'd like to see the EU as a whole move together in that direction. I'm a strong supporter of a people's vote on the final Brexit deal with the right to remain there on the ballot paper. I don't accept that Brexit is necessarily happening yet. 
But if it does happen, then all of us working together will have to do everything we can to ensure a new farm policy is based on a strong commitment, supported by the taxpayer and a well-regulated market, for sustainable, resilient, nature-friendly farming that delivers healthy food for all with high environment, animal welfare and labour standards. And that, I believe, is what is in the na national interest. Thank you.